Morning, sixth grade. Welcome to lesson 21. You had the quiz that you did back from lesson 20, and then you had a brand new power up on lesson E, going with what we just did yesterday in, in investigation two, where we have to know all those names and different vocabularies from uh, investigation two. You could have got all your answers out of that yellow folder, so keep that handy as we work through the terms. We'll see how you did. The distance around a circle is circumference. Every point on the circle is the same distance from its center. The distance across the circle through its center is called the diameter. The distance from the circle to the center is a radius. Two or more circles with the same center are called concentric circles. A segment between two points of a circle is a chord. Part of the circumference is an arc. Notice the an, an article, it means it has to start with a vowel sound, so it's arc. Part of the circle bounded by an arc and two radii is a sector. Half of a circle is a semicircle. The angle whose vertex is in the center is called a central angle. The angle whose vertex is on the circle whose sides are chords is an inscribed angle. And a polygon whose vertices are on the circle whose edges are within the circle is an inscribed polygon. So good review. You'll get that a few more times too. Keep working those vocabulary words. Your mental math section that you answer would read like this. A, you added, you got $2.24. B, you divide by 10, cancels off that $0.65. Subtraction, $4.25. Multiplication is 204. Addition is 4. Dividing by 3 is 12. 3 pints is greater than 1 quart because there's only 2 pints in a quart. Start with the number of sides on a hexagon, 6 times 5, 30, plus 2, 32, divided by 8, 4, plus 1, 5, divided by 5, 1. Okay, your problem solving goes like this. The first even counting number is 2. The sum of the first e two even counting numbers is 6, 2 plus 4. The sum of the first 3, 2 plus 4 plus 6 is 12. Add to this list the sum of the first 5, 6, 4, 5, 6 counting numbers. Does the list of the sums of the even counting numbers have a pattern and can you describe a rule for continuing the sequence? Okay, so I wrote my counting numbers over here, guys. The first one was 2. The second one was 2 plus 4 is 6. The third one was 2 plus 4 plus 6 is 12. 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 is 20 plus another 10 is 30 plus another 12 is 42. Okay, so a lot of us would say, what's the pattern? Well, we're adding even counting numbers, just what the book told us. The problem with that pattern is if I ask you to say, what's the 15th number in the pattern, a lot of us would start going 7 equals 8 equals 9 equals, and that would take us a while to get to 15. Can you imagine if I said, what's the 100th one? So what we really want to do is we want to come up with a pattern that says, I can give any number to it. Now as I was looking at this, guys, I started to notice something. 2 times 3 is 6. 3 times 4 is 12, 4 times 5 is 20, 5 times 6 is 30. So if I wanted the 100th number, I would take 100 times 101 to get there. So if I wanted a rule for that, it would look like this. Remember, they always use k's. k's equals what number? Whatever number you want, plus that number plus 1. So I take the number, and then that number plus 1. So if I wanted, what's the fifth term? I take 5. 5 plus 1 is 6. 5 times 6 is 30, and I have it. Okay? So this is a really fancy algebra rule to try to figure out that pattern. They kind of explain it to you guys. If you turn the page, um, you got the huge, long explanation going there. But challenging my brain to try to think, can I think of the 20th term? Or pick whatever number you want, guys. Just don't pick it a, short, a little one, because lots of times we can get to little ones by just doing the easier math to get there. Okay, yesterday, guys, we did all that investigation working with inscribing a hexagon and a triangle. I'm just going to review that real quick. Remember, when we have to inscribe a hexagon, draw your circle, then mark your hours, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, back to 12 o'clock, and then just connect those dots and you have it. Um, so keep that in mind, and then your power-up is going to pound in those vocabulary words for you. All right, today we're moving on. We got a great lesson today talking about prime and composite numbers and how to do prime factorization. Um, we're going to use prime factorization a lot this year. We're going to use it for reducing fractions, and then we're going to use it for finding least common multiples and greatest common factors. Um, a lot, a lot of stuff that's going to be coming out of this lesson today. Hopefully you have your yellow folder ready to go. Let's get rolling on it on page 150. 
The first part of the lesson says this. We remember that the counting numbers, or called natural numbers from less than 1, are the numbers that we use to count. They are 1 to the rise of 7 out of 10. Counting numbers greater than 1 are either called prime numbers or composite numbers. Notice greater than 1. 1 is not prime. 1 is not composite. A prime number has exactly two different factors. That's why 1 is not a prime number, because its factors are 1 and 1. Well, it's the same number. Okay? Composite number has three or more factors. In the following table, we list the factors of the first 10 counting numbers. You can see that the numbers 2, 3, 5, and 7 have exactly two factors, so they're prime numbers. We see that the factors of each of the prime numbers are 1 and that number. So we define a prime number this way. A prime number is a counting number greater than 1 whose only factors are 1 and the number itself. From the table that we can see, 4, 6, 8, 9, and 10 have three or more factors, so they would be considered composite numbers. Each composite number is divisible by a number other than 1 and itself. Okay, first of all, in your yellow folder, guys, you'll fill in the blank. They give you your definition. Prime numbers are having exactly two factors. Now, as you're reading, I hope you start to think of some of those questions that they could ask you that would be challenging. Question number one, list all the numbers that are not prime or composite. And you hear the word all the numbers. You're like, how many numbers do I need to list? One. One is the only number that is not prime or composite. I shouldn't say that. It's the only counting number that's not prime or composite. Zero is also not prime or composite. Negative one is also not prime or composite. But you, you get the idea of what they can ask you that. And then the other thing, guys, is two is the only even prime number. Everything else, even-wise, is there. So make sure we got that wrapped in our brain. Okay, let's work with some examples quick as we start working the difference between prime and composite. Example one says, make a list of the prime numbers that are less than 16. Okay, number one, they already did 1 through 10 for you. But what I did is I wrote all the numbers less than 16, and my job is to write down all the prime numbers. And so the first thing I did is I crossed out every even number besides 2 because they're not prime numbers. So 14's gone, 12's gone, 10's gone, 8's gone, 6 is gone, and 4 is gone. Okay, then I went through and I crossed out every other one that I know it can be divisible by something. So we already said 1 can't do it. And then I said I can take 9 and divide it by 3, it's gone. And I can take 15 and divide it by 3, and it's gone. So what are my prime numbers? 2, 3, 5, 7. That was in your list already. 11 and 13. Okay. Now, guys, in your yellow folder, I gave you all the prime numbers from 0 to 100. So as we start to work this, if prime numbers aren't that click click for you man use that chart all the time it is very very helpful because as we get to some bigger numbers sometimes I can't remember if they're prime or composite you know I toss out 87 I'm like prime or composite I don't know what can you divide 87 by well and we don't think about it that it's divisible by 3 so um, use those things to help you. example number two it says list the factor pairs for each of these numbers so here's 16 1 and 16, 2 and 8, 4 and 4. Those all give me 16s. 17 is just 1 and 17. 18 is 1 times 18, 2 times 9, 3 times 6. So then they give you the second part, which one of these numbers are prime? Well, 17 would be a prime number because it's only 1 and itself that are factors of it. This is also a good reason why we had that divisibility lesson, I think way back in like lesson 7. So you've been practicing divisibility and divisibility so that hopefully you can see some of these numbers that we might be tempted to think are prime that are really composite. Numbers like 51, you're like, what goes into 51? Well, 5 plus 1 is 6, so 3 goes into it. That's why we already had that lesson. Okay, turning the page to example 3, it says list the composite numbers between 40 and 50. So once again, I listed all the numbers. Now guys, it says between 40 and 50, so that doesn't include 40 and it doesn't include 50. It needs to be between it. Now I'm thinking composite. Which ones can be divisible by more? Well, I know every even number can. So 42, 44, 46, and 48. Now i got to go back and i got to run my divisibility rules on my other ones. Okay, so 4 plus 1 is 5. 3 doesn't go into that one. 7 doesn't go into that one. Does 11? Nope. Does 13? Nope. 17? Nope. Okay, that one's good. We got, uh, this one's a prime. 43 adds together to get 7. Nope, not 3. Not 7. Not 11, not 30. i got to check all those in my head. Gone. 45, of course, it's divisible by 5. 47, 4 plus 7 is 11. No 3. Does 7 go into it? No. 
How about 11 or 13? Those are the main ones I have to check, guys. Nope, so that one's prime. 49 is divisible by 7, so I have it, my list. 42, 44, 45, 46, 48, and 49. You can see the easy question. They just say, hey, list all these things. Now, if I was a 6th grader and this wasn't quick for me, guys, what I would do is I'd literally pull out my yellow folder and say, hey, what 40s are prime, 41 and 43 and 47? That gives me the list. Everything else is composite. Use that thing to help you because it takes a lot of work to get those things done. Okay, second part of the lesson, prime factorization. It says every composite number can be composed or formed by multiplying two or more prime numbers. Here we show each of the first nine composite numbers as a product of the prime factor. So four is two and two, obviously. Six is two and three. Eight is two times two times two. Eight is not two times four because four is not a prime number, guys. So it's gotta be, always be a prime number. Nine is three and three, 10, two and five, 12. Two times two times three, okay? You get the pattern with that. 14, 15, and 16. Notice the factors of 8 is what I just explained to you. It's 2 times 2 times 4, not 4, because 4 is not prime. So this is called prime factorization. Okay, now I'm going to skip 4 and 5 for a second. I'm just going to go to this big, huge explanation over here on how we actually do prime factorization. So jump to page 153 with me. I'm going to keep reading how we get prime factorization. It says, there are two commonly used methods for factoring composite numbers. One method is called the factor tree. The other method uses division by primes. So here we're going to factor the 420 using both methods. To factor a number using a factor tree, we first write the number. Below the number, we write any two whole numbers greater than one that multiply to give you that number. If these numbers are not prime, we continue the process until they are prime numbers at the end of each branch of the factor tree. These numbers are the prime factors of the original number. Then we write them in order from least to greatest. Okay, so. I started with 420, I said 10 times 42 gave me, 10 is not prime, it's from 2 and 5, good, I got those. 42 is 6 and 7, great, 7, but I got to work with 6 and then get to the 2 and the 3. Then when I write it, guys, did you notice what they said? Please write it in order from least to greatest. So there's 1, there's two 2's, there's a 3, there's a 5, there's a 7. Okay, second method. To factor a number using division by primes, we write the number in the division box and divide by the smallest prime number that's a factor. Then we divide the resulting quotient by the smallest prime number that's a factor. And we repeat this process until you get a quotient of 1 at the top. Now they see that little number 1, you can go to the bottom, it's like a footnote in the Bible, and they say some people prefer to divide until the quotient is a prime number. In this case, the final quotient is divided in the list of prime numbers. I don't like that, so I'll show you what they're talking about there. The division of our prime factors are the same. So I start with 420 in the bottom. I divide by 2. It goes in there 210 times. Divide that number by 2. It goes in there 105. Divide by 3. It goes in there 35. Divide by 5. It goes in there 7. Divide by 7. I got the 1 at the top. All my divisors then are my prime factorization. Now notice if you do it right, guys, then it's right in order of least to greatest. Okay, the challenge with division by primes in my mind is... You don't have a place to show your work. So you have to be able to divide 210 by 3, I mean 210 by 2 to get 105 in your head, and then divide that number by 3 in your head to get to 35. That might be too challenging for you. So you might like uh, to do the factor tree. Let's go back and do 4 and 5, and then we'll finish out how to find greatest common factor. 4 says write the prime factorization of 30. I'm going to use factor trees on this one. So 30, I instantly go to 5 and 6. You might have done 3 and 10. It doesn't matter. I did 5 and 6. I broke 6 down to 2 and 3, so I'm done. Prime factor, prime factor, prime factor. How do I write it? In order, 2 times 3 times 5. 81 gives me 9 and 9. 9 gives me 3 and 3. This 9 gives me 3 and 3. So it's 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. In the future, we'll learn how to write this with exponents. You'd write 3 to the 4th power. 420, guys, your book already did it for you, okay? So they did 10 and 42. They broke 10 down to 5 and 2. They broke 42 of 6 and 7. They broke 6 to 2 and 3. They gave you the 2, 2, 3, 5, and 7, okay? Number 5 says write the prime factorization of 10 and the square, I'm sorry, 100 and the square root of 100. So first of all, the square root of 100 is 10. Now I'm going to do division by primes with this one just so you get a practice at it. So I have 100, I divide it by 2, that gives me 50. I divide it by 2, that gives me 25. I divide it by 5, that gives me 5. I divide it by 5, again, I got the 1 on the top, so here's my answer. 
It's 2 times 2 times 5 times 5. 10 would look like this. 10 divided by 2 is 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1. So 10 equals 2 and 10 equals 5. Now they're trying to teach you something, guys. Anytime you have the number and its prime and its um, square root, sorry. So the number and its square root, you always take these numbers and you cut them in half. So you notice there's two twos here. There's only one two here. There's two fives here, so there's only one five there. So in the future, what I do is I take the smaller number, in this case it would always be the square root number, get my answer, figure it out, and then I just double everything. If there's one two, now there's two twos. If there's one five, now there's two fives. If they were asking me what's the square root of 10,000, which is 100, and then they asked me what's the prime factorization of 10,000, I would double those. Double two to four, double five, two fives to four fives. That's how you do that one a little bit faster. Okay, one more down at the bottom of page 153. It says, we can use prime factorization to help us find the greatest common factor of two numbers. Here's how you do it. Step one, identif list the prime factors of each number, identify the shared factors, and multiply the shared factors to find the GCF. So number six says, write the prime factorization of 36 and 60, use the results to find the greatest common factor of 36 and 60. Okay. I'm going to do division by primes again to get one more practice. Divide by 2, sorry, divide by 2 gives me 18. Divide by 2 gives me 9. Divide by 3 gives me 3. Divide by 3 gives me 1. I have 2, 2, 3, 3. Division by 60. Divide by 2 is 30. Divide by 2 is 15. Divide by 3 is 5. Divide by 5 is 1. I'm going to write those. 2, 2, 3, 5. Now it says, identify the shared ones. One shared, two shared, three shared. Now do what with those numbers? Multiply them. Two times two is four, times three is 12. The greatest common factor between 36 and 60 is 12. Now you've been working greatest common factor for a while, guys. Uh, what they're gonna do now is give you much bigger numbers. And they're gonna say, do the prime factorization of those numbers and then Find the ones that are in both lists and multiply those together to get the GCF. And so it's another way to find greatest common factor. That would be another way to do that. The other way they're going to do that to you is say, we want you to reduce a fraction using GCF. And so they'll give you 36 sixtieths and say reduce it. And some students do this method to reduce it to get the GCF. Okay, big lesson today, guys. Uh, took a while, sorry about that. But a lot of things that we got to do a lot of math with that we'll be using a ton in the future with fractions and uh, reducing and finding common multiples. All right, we'll get set, get your answer key out, we'll get ready to roll with questions. Okay, sixth grade, here we start going with our lesson for today on problem set 21. Number one says, two-thirds of the students wore green on St. Patrick's Day. What fraction of students did not wear green? So, guys, remember, I have to add up to a whole one, which would be three-thirds. If two-thirds did, I just subtract it from the whole group, which is three-thirds, and I get an answer of one-third. Number two, 347 quills were carefully placed. I'm going to write that number right now. 347 quills were carefully placed into seven compartments. If each compartment held the same number of quills, how many were in each compartment? So I'm equal grouping, dividing it out into those equal groups. Seven goes into 34 four times. That's 28. I subtract. I, look at that. I wrote down 347, 343. Uh, subtract, I get a 6, bring down the 3, 7 goes into 63 9 times, that's 63, which is zero remainder. Uh, so my answer is what I'm working with is quills. There are 49 quills in each compartment. Number 5, it says write each number as a reduced fraction. I start with 3 and 12 over 21. I'm going to divide both of those by 3. 12 divided by 3 is 4. 21 divided by 3 is 7. My whole number stays with it, so I have 3 and 4 sevenths. Next is 12 over 48. I saw that I could go by 6, so I divided it by 6 and got 2. I divided it by 6 and got 8. Then I realized it could have been div divided by 12, but I didn't see that right away. So now I just have to divide them both by 2 again. That gives me a 1 and a 4. So it took me two steps because I didn't see... Oops, sorry. 
I didn't see that this was divisible by 12 at the beginning. Guys, no big deal. You might have started by dividing by 2 at the beginning if you see that they're even. So don't always sweat on. I didn't see it right away. Just go. Next one is percent. Percent means out of 100. So I have 12 over 100. I divide this one by 4. Gives me 3. Divide that by 4. There are 4 quarters and a dollar. So it's 25. That's reduced to lowest terms. 3 25ths. Number 6. It says, list the prime numbers between 50 and 60. <laughs> Sixth grade, you do what you want. I just grabbed my yellow folder, and my yellow folder had the number 53 there, and the yellow folder had the number 59 there, and I'm done. 51 is divisible by 3. 57 is divisible by 3. 55 is divisible by 9. I mean, 55 is divisible by 5. Every other number is divisible by 2 because they're even. But instead of working through everything, I just use my resource, that beautiful yellow folder. Number seven says write the prime factorization of each number. Okay, for the first one, I'm going to use a factor tree. So I have 50 is 5 and 10, and 10 is 2 and 5. Now in order from least to greatest is 2 times 5 times 5. 60, we already did that once. I'll just review it to you from the lesson today, prime by primes is divided by, divide by 2 is 30. Divide by 2 again is 15. Divide by 3 is 5. And divide by 5 is 1. Remember, you have to keep dividing until you get a 1 up here. Then all these numbers are your answer. So 50 is divisible by 2 and 3 and another 2. Sorry about that. And 5. Okay, and then we have one more to do, 300. I'm going to do a new screen. 300 is 30 and 10. Well, 30 is 5 and 6, and 6 is 2 and 3, and 10 is 2 and 5. Okay, now i got to write them in order. I have this 2, and I have this 2, and then I have a 3, and then I have a 5 and a 5. So make sure you have them all. Lots of times in my head I'll quick check it. 4, 25, 4, that's 4, that's 25, that's 100, that's 300. Good. Okay, number 10. How many one-thirds are in 3? We know, guys, what we have to do when we have a fraction is multiply by the reciprocal. So how many one-thirds are in 3? Flip that over. You have 3 of them in 1. Then the next question is how many of them are in uh, 3? Well, if there's 3 in 1 and I now have 3, i got to just multiply those together. 3 times 3 is 9. Okay. 11. The perimeter of a regular quadrilateral is 12 inches. A regular quadrilateral, guys, would be called a square. Its perimeter is 12. What is its area? Step one, I have to figure out what its side is. I do that by taking perimeter and dividing by four because quadrilateral means four-sided. That gives me three. That tells me three, 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 three. To find the area, it's side times side. So three times three is nine. The area equals nine square inches. Don't forget your label with area. Uh, number 13, find the perimeter of this hexagon. Okay, I love it. They gave me 8, they gave me 3, they gave me 12, they gave me 5. I'm missing pieces. I'm missing the total piece, guys. I'm missing the total horizontal at the top here. So I find my other two horizontals. That's 12, that's 3. I add them together, I get a 15. I'm missing this vertical piece. So I have the big vertical and I have a piece. So I subtract 8 minus 5 is 3. And now I just add them together. Now, how do I do that? To check real quickly, guys, I take the total vertical and the total horizontal and I add those. That gives me 23 and I times it by 2. It gives me 46. Remember how we have that shortcut with our L shapes. My label is 46 inches. If you did the math the other way, you'd have had 23, 26, 29, 30. 41, 46, okay? Same thing. Don't forget your label of inches, 46 inches. Flipping your answer key over, number 17. Missing the dividend means I need to multiply. 
50 times 25, that's 0, 25. Add a 0, 0, and 10. 0, 5, 2, 1. 1,250. Number 19, missing the first in subtraction means I need to add. So I take 3 and 2 thirds plus 1 and 2 thirds and I add them together. 2 plus 2 is 4 thirds. 3 plus 1 is 4. Simplify this. I add 3 goes into 4 one time. I have 1 third left over. 4 plus 1 is 5 and 1 third when it is simplified. 22 literally looks like this, guys. 2 thirds times 2 thirds times 2 thirds. So 2 thirds to the third power. Multiply the tops. 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8. Multiply the bottoms. 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. I have 8 27 So cube the top number, cube the bottom number, or said properly, cube the numerator, cube the denominator. 23, write the prime factorization of 200. 25. So I take 225 and I'm going to, if I was good, know my perfect squares. My perfect squares is 15 times 15 is 225. Some of you might have just divided by 5. Some of you might have divided by 25. Doesn't matter. We're all going to get to the same place. The reason I like to try to get the middle ones, like this is super cool. They're the same because as soon as I break 15 down on one side, I know it's 3 and 5 on the other side. Now, written in order from least to greatest is 3 times 3 times 5 times 5. B, find the square root of 225 and write its prime factorization. Well, guys, I already did that. That's 15. But remember from today's lesson, what do I do with these things? I cut them in half. Here I had two threes, so for B, I just need one three. Here I have two fives, so for B, I only need one five. 24. Describe how finding the greatest common factor of the numerator and the denominator of a fraction can help reduce the fraction. If I know the GCF, guys, the greatest common factor, I reduce in one step. So that's the benefit of knowing the greatest common factor. So if we go back to that problem where it was 12 over 48, and I didn't realize the GCF was 12, I just divided by 6, it took me two steps. I divided by 6, and then I had to divide by 2. If you knew GCF, you'd have just divided by 12 and been done in one step. So guys, that's the only advantage. What you need to decide in your head is, can I find GCF faster than Bauer can do two division problems? I had to divide by 6, and I had to divide by 2, I had to do it twice. But if it takes you longer to think of 12, then do two division problems. Number 26, write 1 and 3 fourths as an improper, multiply... Add 4, 5, 6, 7 over 4. Multiply the improper fraction by the reciprocal. Flip. 3 over 2. Write the product as a mixed number. Multiply the top. 21. Multiply the bottom. 8. It's a division problem. Top in, bottom out. Goes in there twice. Is 16. Is 5. So I have 2 and 5 eighths. And last is 28, guys. Alicia's father asked her to buy a gallon of milk at the store. The store had milk only in quart size containers. What percent of a gallon is a quart? How many quarts did she buy? Well, to figure out the percent, I need to know that there are four quarts in a gallon, guys. So she was buying one-fourth. So what percent is one-fourth? That needs to be memorized. That's 25% of a gallon. So how many did she need to buy? She needed to buy four quarts. So working your U.S. capacity from Lesson 16.